Before Vin Diesel was bloodshot, Valiant was just the little comic book company that could, or rather, tried, and then went bankrupt and then got bought by a video game company. I'm Dave Baker, today on Total Nerd, we're going to explain the history of Valiant Comics, how they got turned into a video game IP farm, and how it all came crashing down. Before we get started, subscribe to the Total Nerd channel, leave a comment, and let us know what Total Nerd topics you'd like us to explain next. James Jim Shooter was born on September 27th, 1951. Getting his start in comics at the ripe old age of 13, Shooter wrote and drew stories for DC Comics' Legion of Superheroes. He's one of the youngest people to ever work at the Big Two. After rising through the ranks of the creative class, Shooter took a job as a writer and editor at Marvel Comics. He eventually ascended to the role of Editor-in-Chief of Marvel, shepherding the wildly popular Secret Wars to shelves. He was known for his brass nature and meticulous storytelling philosophy. He believed in clear, concise storytelling and didn't like wild or inventive layouts. If it wasn't a grid, old ponytail in chief wasn't having it. Many of the pros from this era have stories about Shooter rewriting their stories at the final hour. During his time at Marvel, Shooter also contributed to many positive status quo shifts. He initiated an art return policy, a residuals program, and was widely credited with correcting the sales slump that Marvel was in during this time. He also pissed off just about everybody. So, you know, in 1987, he was fired. Shooter, fueled by a need for what some may refer to as revenge, found a group of investors and attempted to buy Marvel Comics. Yeah, that's right. Shooter, Stephen J. Mazarski, and a group of investors attempted to purchase Marvel from their owners, Cineworld Pictures. Unfortunately, or fortunately, they were outbid by Ron Perlman. No, not Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman. This guy holds shares in Revlon and a bunch of other companies that uh, probably end in Tonix or Siska or Iskanalon! I don't know. Evil business sounding names. So, Marvel be damned. Shooter and his investors founded Voyager Communications. They would publish comics and related merchandise starting in 1989. Initially, while attempting to sort out their opening lineup of books, Valiant released licensed comics based on Nintendo and the WWF. <gasps> WWF, brother! Within the next two years, Valiant would toss their hat in the proverbial superheroes are big, let's make some game. Valiant licensed the old Western publishing line characters and then also produced numerous fresh creations by contemporary working pros like Barry Windsor Smith, Bob Layton, and David Lapham. 1991 was the year of Valiant, or at least they wanted it to be. The company made a big splash with characters like Solar, Man of the Atom, a rebooted 50s character called Dr. Solar, and Magnus Robot Fighter, another rebooted 50s character who was a robot fighter, like his name implies. Oh, and Rai, a superpowered character who protects New Japan in the year 4000. From here, Valiant built out their roster with characters like Exo Man of War, who was basically what if Conan was inside an Iron Man suit, Shadow Man, a jazz saxophone player by night and a superhero by later night, and then Ninjax, a dude who is white and a ninja, and he has a costume with one of those, you know, those things where it leaves your hair going, you know, everywhere in the 90s. Because, you know, when you're sneaking around being culturally appropriate of ninja, you gotta let those follicles breathe, baby! Last but not least, the characters Valiant published included was, drumroll please, Turok. Yeah, that Turok. The Turok that either you first encountered from a video game, we'll be getting there, or from the 130 issues from Dell Goldkey that were published from 1956 all the way up to 1982. The book, Turok Son of Stone, follows the titular Turok and his little brother, the mildly annoying preteen reader stand-in Andar, as they attempt to live in the Lost Valley that is somehow still populated by dinosaurs? Are these books wildly inaccurate in both matters of indigenous representation and scientific accuracy? Hell yes! Apparently not, because this bad boy ran for 30 freaking years! The one takeaway from all of this? At least these Dell issues got dope-ass painted covers! Problematic aspects aside. The Valiant books? Eh. They went for more bargain basement car wash Jim Lee vibe. Not exactly... Timeless.
pretty much right out of the gate, Valiant started playing into the speculator bullshit. What does that mean? Well, in the 1990s, there was a dangerous trend where people thought that if they bought a bunch of something and then squirreled it away, it would eventually be worth something. You know, like those news reports consistently have the, oh, this copy of Action Comics number one sold for a million dollars. So this resulted in thousands and thousands of people buying shit tons of books that they didn't want because they were special variants or they had chromium covers but they were really limited editions, they would be even worth more? It's bullshit, none of this is real. And of course, all of this bullshit is completely manufactured and highly detrimental to the actual medium of comics. And you know, we're doing the same thing right now. It's fine, it's fine. Marvel, DC, and numerous other companies still artificially inflate sales by selling variant covers to people who think that they'll be worth something in the long run, which just isn't the case. You should be reading comics because you love comics. Or not? I don't know. By 1994, they'd run aground. They were bleeding money. It's almost like playing dirty pool and running variant schemes don't actually grow your reader base. Huh, it's almost like that's a negative thing. Weird. Jim Shooter got pushed out of Valiant and the rest of the Yahoo suits that thought they could run a comic book company, well, they failed. Which brings us to Acclaim Entertainment, a video game company that was looking for intellectual property that it could purchase with the goal of exploiting it in video game adaptation. They bought Valiant for $65 million in 1994. Acclaim had also, not long before this, acquired a development studio named Iguana Entertainment. They were most widely recognized for making the NFL quarterback club games and Arrow the Acrobat. However, they soon cemented their legacy as being known as the company that brought a generation of gamers, Turok Dinosaur Hunter. Yeah, Turok for N64 arguably paved the way for console FPS games. It's now an iconic game where you play as a titular dino assassin who in fact spends most of his free time, as you would assume, hunting dinosaurs. Who'd have thunk it? Upon its release, Turok received rave reviews and was a massive commercial success for Acclaim. Turok made roughly 60 million in June 1997. Turok alone accounted for roughly 45% of Acclaim's revenue for that quarter. Turok would hold the top spot in the nation for video game rentals. Remember those? You would go to the back of a Hollywood video or wherever and they'd have stacks of games and you'd never be able to rent them because you'd always be like, how am I gonna beat this whole game in a weekend? Well. Apparently, you were the only one that thought that, because people loved Turok. The initial installment would set the template for many of the games that would come afterwards. Turok 2, Seeds of Evil, Turok Rage Wars, Turok Shadow of Oblivion, Turok Evolution, and of course, there's the 2008 game simply titled Turok, which, you know, is a game you can play. 99 saw the release of Shadow Man, a game about Michael Leroy taking up the mantle of Shadow Man, a voodoo warrior, and fighting against a legion of evildoers as they attempt to spark the apocalypse. Much of the complex continuity and mythology behind Shadow Man was jettisoned in the game's final build. In an era that's almost completely devoid of horror games, Shadow Man stands out considerably though. Was it the greatest game ever made? No. Not by a long shot. However, it was a major AAA release that was received well at the time. Since then, it spawned a sequel game titled Shadow Man 2 Eckend Coming. Shadow Man 2 Eckend Coming. Or Second Coming? I don't know. Why do they title it this way? But the game was released on PS2 in 2002. Seems like it could be, you know, a little bit of a recurring 2 theme that they could have worked into the marketing. But instead, eh, they went for the most confusing logo of all time. The game? It was honestly pretty forgettable. However, during the gear up for the release of the game, Acclaim tried to have a marketing stunt happen where they would hang a mini billboard off of someone's tombstone. They offered to pay the deceased family a handsome sum of money for this privilege. However, it was met with a resounding, thanks, but y'all stupid. <laughs> Acclaim also produced possibly the weirdest crossover game in the history of weirdo crossover games. Iron Man and Exo Manowar in heavy metal for the Sega Saturn. And yes, that clumsy ass title is actually the title that the game was shipped with. The story sees Tony Stark and Eric of Dacia, 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 Dacia? I've never actually heard anybody say it out loud, teaming up to recover the lost fragments of the Cosmic Cube to say that the game was received very, very well. It would be a lie. Sega Saturn Magazine gave the game a 33%. GameSpot 
5.2 out of 10, baby. I mean, look, 1996 wasn't exactly the best year for graphics, but come on. Most of the games that Acclaim made with the Valiant rights have been largely forgotten and relegated to nostalgia YouTube channel ecosystems and people making playthrough videos and saying shit like, I remember this, and oh man, I don't remember this. Aside from the initial Turok game, Acclaim's Valiant-based games made millions and millions of dollars, and yet they're widely forgotten. Why is that? Were the titles just that forgettable? Were the characters just not built to last? Honestly, I have no idea. In 2005, Acclaim ran aground, and then they auctioned off their assets. This was the final defeat after a long and extended slide into bankruptcy that prompted many questionable marketing decisions like the aforementioned Tombstone gag. They also ran a promo for a campaign that had a prize of $10,000 to anyone who'd name their child Turok in conjunction with the release of Turok Evolution. Ugh. Bad taste, guys. Bad taste. Around this time, another group of investors, led by Dinesh Shamdasani and Jason Kathari, raised enough money to procure the Valiant back catalog from Acclaim, forming Valiant Entertainment. In a similar trajectory to the Acclaim video game scheme, the new Valiant, aka Valiant 2.0, had its sight set on turning the comics into you guessed it, movies. Because no one actually wants to make good comics, they just want to use them as idea brochures for companies with boatloads of cash and unimaginative development executives. Since then, they've been producing high quality comics and you'd expect that they would get read by people somewhere. And they've gotten their wish. Vin Diesel is bloodshot. Congrats to all the people involved. But I'd be lying if I said my heart belonged to anything other than N64's Turok Dinosaur Hunter. Well, what do you think? Does Valiant's video game empire back catalog hold up? Are we ever going to see a Turok movie? Uh, probably not, because the Valiant Entertainment doesn't control the rights to that any longer. Do you know anyone who's actually read a Valiant Entertainment comic? Congratulate them for me. They're, they're, they're a rare breed and a sacred few. Well, if you like this video, please comment below and let us know what other areas of nerd culture need an explainer. And in the meantime, like, comment, and subscribe for more Total Nerd videos.